Crossroads. It's good to be back worshiping with you today, especially after being gone for the past two weeks on a trip with my wife, Christy, visiting some of the places that the Apostle Paul actually walked when he was here on the earth. We got to visit places like Thessalonica and Philippi. We got to go to Athens and Berea, to Corinth, and we spent a few days in Rome as well. And already people have asked me like, so how was your trip? And that's a really hard question to answer. And so I'll just direct you to my wife and I's Facebook page because she took some awesome pictures and captioned everything that we saw there. And if you're not friends with us on Facebook, just send us a request, we're happy to do that. You know, summing up an experience like we had um, is really difficult. So I thought maybe the best way to do it is just in three categories. You'll see some of the pictures up here. The first category is just ancient history. The second category is church history, and the third category is food. Let me start with ancient history. I'll be honest, I didn't get the highest grades in world history as a student, but I was overwhelmed, I mean, just very taken back by the monstrosity size of the things that I saw, especially things dating all the way back to like 1500 BC. I mean, it was just incredible to me to walk by these, these uh, temples, the amphitheater, the Colosseum, uh, places that had such handiwork and workmanship and such fine detail made so long ago. I mean, that just blew my mind. Now, I've always been interested in church history, and so to walk in some of the places where the Apostle Paul actually took the gospel for the very first time was even more incredible. We got to visit at a place in Philippi where they believed that Lydia was baptized. Lydia was the first person in all the continent of Europe to come to faith in Jesus. Paul had preached the gospel to her and some of the Jewish people around her, and they decided to place their faith in Jesus and be baptized. And we were able to see this river where that happened. It was about 45 degrees that day, so we decided just to look and not necessarily experience the full experience by getting in the water. We also went to places like Corinth where Paul had preached the gospel in Philippi. We were able to see the prison where he and Silas were captured and put in prison. They were singing and they had a miraculous delivery. The uh, chains fell off, the doors opened, and the Philippian jailer was led to Christ. I mean, those places actually literally exist. It's not just make-believe or Walt Disney-esque type things. Places you could touch and see with your own eyes. And that had a really deepening experience in my faith. I hope it's not just a once in a lifetime experience. Now let's talk about food. I'll just be honest, I've heard more tomato products, pastries, uh, pasta, and bread in the past 10 days to shatter any like New Year's resolution health goals, not just for this year, but probably for the next five, right? So it's back to my running routine tomorrow. I will make this disclaimer though, we got quite a bit of exercise. I calculated yesterday and this morning that we walked over 65 miles in the past 10 days. So our legs were screaming at some points of being able to see all the sights. But as I mentioned before we left, the purpose of this trip was organized to help pastors like myself have these meaningful experiences, but also so that we could offer these experiences to the congregations we serve. And I wanted to let you know that is our plan in 2025. We hope to create and offer an experience either to the places that we just visited, walking the footsteps of Paul, or still on the table is actually to visit Israel and to the places where Jesus actually walked. There's a big asterisk by that one, as you could well imagine. I wanted to let you know we're working on those details. I'll get that information to you in, in the very near future. Since the very beginning of this year, what we've been trying to do as a congregation in a series called Who Are You? Or Who Are We? is just let you know who we are. We started by talking about the biblical mandate that God has for his church and that the mission of the church is to make disciples of all people. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all authority has been given to me, so you go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've taught you, and I'll be with you to the very end of the age. That is the mission of God's church, to make disciples of all people. Last week, we looked at how we feel led here at Crossroads to be part of God's mission. And that is by living out the vision to help people live in love like Jesus. Andrew Bonner did a great job in packing what the biblical compulsion is for all of us being formed into the image of Jesus. And today what we want to do is kind of take that big idea and break it down into three categories. Much like difficulty of summarizing the trip that Christy and I just had, boiling down the life of Jesus is not a real easy task. 
But after we just felt God's leading toward our vision being helping people live and love like Jesus, myself and some of our staff worked through the New Testament just looking at the life of Jesus and trying to put it into some categories that we could really foster and grow in in our living and loving like Jesus. And so today, I want to unpack what those three categories are. Before I do, I hope that if you've been around Crossroads for the last two or three years, you might be able to answer this question, who are we? What does it mean to live and love like Jesus? And you'd be able to tell people, well, it means about being with God, being with others, and being sent. Today we want to talk about what all three of those look like in the life of Jesus and how you and I can live and love like him. So let's get started. First of all, what we see in the life of Jesus is that Jesus engaged in an intimate way with his heavenly father, God. And that for us is where we determine we want to be with God. Now the Bible is very clear that Jesus is fully God. We're going to talk about that from a theological, biblical standpoint in, in our next series. We're titling that one, What We Believe. These eight weeks to kick off the beginning of the year are to help answer those two questions. Who are we? What do we believe? But Jesus is in his full humanity taught us how to engage in a relationship with God. It was his number one priority. Jesus displayed the full character of God so that we could get a clear picture of who God truly, truly is. He often told stories, stories called parables, that were to illustrate the heart of God so that we would know his will and his ways, his desire for all humanity. Jesus was deliberate in interacting with God through prayer, through study of scripture, through listening to the Holy Spirit and interacting with God in, in a deep, meaningful way. All of the accounts of Jesus' life speak of him going in a private place to be with his Father, to have time with him, to encounter him in, in solitude. But it also records Jesus praying in public for him worshiping on a regular basis. Jesus knew the Old Testament. He was a student of God's word. And we see that displayed from an early age when Jesus is about 12 years old. He had gone to Jerusalem with his parents to celebrate the Passover. And they thought as they were returning to Nazareth that he was just hanging out with some of his cousins or some of his other relatives. But actually he had stayed back in Jerusalem, something up to five days. And then where did Mary and Joseph, his parents, find him? But in the temple, talking to the religious teachers. He was listening to their instruction, but also asking them questions. He had a hunger and a thirst for God's word. We see that play out in all the life of Jesus. His knowledge of scripture allowed him to discern what was best for his life in God's will. It also helped him address the misunderstandings that people had about God or his ways in their life. Jesus' commitment to God's word is something that we should emulate. His practice of spiritual practices like prayer and solitude, fasting, those are things that are not antiquated or just for Jesus. They're ways that we can nurture intimacy with God. They're practices that we can develop and nurture in our life so that we'll grow closer to him. Jesus trusted and obeyed the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit leading Jesus into the desert where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And after that, Jesus was actually tempted by Satan himself. And after that time of testing in which Jesus was victorious through the power of the Holy Spirit and his knowledge of Scripture, the Holy Spirit comforted him. Jesus promised that same Holy Spirit would be our guide would be our counselor, would be our comforter also. I mean, if there was anyone who could have taken a pass on being with God, it would have been Jesus, right? Because he already was fully God. But we see the hurt. What hurt Jesus the most on the cross was that separation from him and his father. And that's why he cried out in a loud voice from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus knew God's character, he understood the teachings of Scripture, he engaged with his Father in spiritual practices, he obeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit, this enabled Jesus to trust and obey, and obey God's plan for his life, even up to death, death on a cross. And because Jesus died in our place, he opened up access to the throne room of God for all humanity so that we could 
enter God's presence with confidence. We can find mercy for our sins and we can find grace in our help, time of our grace to help us in our time of need. Given open access like that to the Father, why would you and I not develop intimacy by being with God like Jesus did? It might be that we have an inaccurate view of who God is. Some people picture God like their grandpa. Was a nice guy at one point, probably really active and engaged, but right now he kind of falls asleep in the recliner on a regular basis while often rocking the children he's supposed to be putting to sleep. I mean, a little bit forgetful, a little bit out of touch with reality, maybe too tired or too old to notice or to care or even to respond. So you kind of find like a little disinterested in developing a relationship with someone like that maybe. Or maybe your view of God is that he's the cosmic sheriff in the sky. He's ready to just pounce on you as soon as you do something that breaks the law. Why would you want to have a relationship with some mean ogre like that? Or maybe your view of God is kind of like the busy mechanic. You have a small little problem that you take to him, but he's got a really big responsibility of controlling the whole world. And so covered with grease and a little impatient, you're like, I just won't mess with him. My problem's way too insignificant. If that's how you view God, why would you want to have a relationship with someone like that? One of my favorite moments of our trip, especially in Athens, or yeah, in Athens, was visiting the area called Mars Hill. Here's some pictures of Mars Hill. Mars Hill is actually the moment, the place where Paul encountered some of the leading philosophers of his day. He had a compliment for the people of Athens. He looked around while he was there and he said, I can tell that you're very religious people. You have temples everywhere. You have all these gods. You have places to worship. And I noticed this one altar that said, to an unknown God, I'd like to tell you about this one God you seem to not know about. And then Paul eloquently and deliberately shares with him about the true character of God. Let me just read a couple of words of what he said. He said, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by human hands. See the irony there? He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him, we live, we move, and we have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul was on Mars Hill making this great proclamation of God. And if you go through the valley and you end up on the, um, the Acropolis, what you'll see there are all these temples and all these idols. And Paul was making a strong distinction about the gods of this world and the one true God. Jesus came to show us an accurate picture of God's true character. And scripture gives us this accurate account of God's will and his ways. When we engage with God through studying his word, through prayer, by fasting and other spiritual practices, we develop trust and intimacy more and more. And relying on the presence, the power, as well as the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our lives helps us encounter God and his power in our life in bigger ways. You see, God didn't come just to be with us. God came to be in us through the Holy Spirit. We're here to help every person who calls Crossroads home know how to be with God so they can live in love like Jesus. Several years ago, we developed a tool we called the Roadmap. It's an online platform for you to receive like practical action steps you can take and resources that are available to help you be with God. Under the Be With God category, we list these things. We wanna know what God is like. We wanna read and study God's word. We wanna develop spiritual practices. We wanna to listen to the Holy Spirit. These are ways that we know would help us be with God so that we can be more like Jesus, living and loving like him. In November, we did a survey here at Crossroads of just our people. And almost 75% of people said that the roadmap has been somewhat helpful, helpful or very helpful. So we know that's a resource that we wanna to continue to keep updated and maintain so that you can continue to have fresh content that will help people help you live and love like Jesus by being with God. 
If you've not checked out the roadmap, you can find it at that address, cccgo.com forward slash roadmap. The next expression that we observed in the life of Jesus was in the being with others. Jesus engaged in community. Again, if anyone could have been a solo act, it would have been Jesus. But I love that Jesus loved and engaged with people. Let me make sure that you didn't misunderstand what I just said. I'm not saying that Jesus was an extrovert. I'm just saying that he pursued meaningful relationships. He engaged in community, and he recognized his influence in the lives of others. You know, some in our world today have become a little disenchanted about their experience with God's people. They get a little disappointed. They get a little discouraged. They get a little offended and hurt, and they often come to this conclusion. I'm really good with God, but I don't really need God's people. I'm okay nurturing my relationship with God, but I don't really need to be connected with anybody else. Well, not only did God command us to gather together as his people, he promises his presence is with us when we do. And Jesus, he prioritized being with God's people early in his public ministry. Luke records that Jesus went back to his hometown. He started talking with people that had been maybe influential in his life, maybe some of his mentors, some of his friends, people he might not have seen for a long time. It says that as was his custom, he went there to the synagogue to worship God. This was his consistent routine. This was his deliberate, normal practice. It's because Jesus recognized the importance of community, the fellowship, the encouragement, the admonition, as well as the accountability that community with God's people brings. He pursued it personally, and he also facilitated it among others. Jesus personally invited people into his life to do life with him and him with them, to teach them, but also to be encouraged and comforted by them. I think we often miss that point. I love how the series The Chosen illustrates Jesus' relationship with people. You see, that's very two way. It's, it's very mutual. Jesus is blessing and benefiting them, but also he's benefiting from them. I think both of those honor God. Jesus recognized the fluence, influence that he could and should have by always making time for others, always offering a listening ear, maybe lending a helping hand, correcting and, ch and challenging any misunderstanding people had of scripture, praying with and for others. I look at Jesus living out life to the full. He was truly loving God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, with all of his strength. But he was also loving others, his neighbors, as he loved himself. The two greatest commandments. You see, community is something that we must continue to engage in if we want to live and love like Jesus did. We need each other. That's why we gather weekly, so that we can worship so that we can pray, so we can study God's word together, so that we can encourage each other. We do that in a big group like this every Sunday morning, but we also do that throughout the week in smaller groups for accountability, for support. We do that in groups of five or 10. We even do that just one-on-one, -on -one, all for the purpose of living and loving like Jesus. You see, we were not created to do life alone. Remember what God said when he created the first man and woman. It is not good for man or woman to be alone. So we're here to help you. Last Sunday, we offered Groups Sunday. It was a chance for anybody who doesn't feel connected to anyone else here at Crossroads to find a place where they could get connected. We have a wide variety of groups that meet. And our website does a great job of presenting different groups that you can choose to join right here on the spot. In fact, if you want to pull out your phone right now and visit cccgo.com forward slash groups, find a group for you to get connected to. We'll continue to find ways in this large group to get connected to each other. We're going to instigate, or maybe better said, facilitate opportunities for you to not feel alone when you walk in this room. A chance for you to huddle up in small groups to talk about things we're learning or to share spiritual practices together. It is not okay for us for you to remain in obscurity or even in isolation or anonymity. That's not who we are. So we want to continue to support each one of you who call Crossroads home. 
And let me just say, as your pastor, if right now you don't feel like this church is supporting you in ways that, in loving ways that are meaningful to you in meeting the needs that you have, that's what we're here for. We want to do that. And so we have opportunity every time we gather for worship for elders and our care team to be available to our congregation. Our Connection Center is there for you to find help and resources that you might need. We also have someone on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, because that's how we want to care. We want to shepherd our people like Jesus does. We want to be a place that's safe, especially for people who feel lost or alone or confused or uh, offended or, or struggling. We want to care for you in very tangible ways. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. He lived his life that way. And we have to do that individually as well as collectively. If you're looking for ways to engage with others, I'd encourage you to check out the Be With Others section of our uh, roadmap. Look what it says there. It, it gives you ways that you could gather with others. It talks about the importance and some of the action steps you could take. It facilitates ways for you to find support, to invite accountability, to grow with others, to serve with others. And also to recognize that we all have influence within our families, within our workplaces, in the neighborhoods we live, everywhere we go. We can be people who are on mission. And that's part of being with others as well. The third expression that we want to talk about today is how Jesus lived in love by being sent. Jesus engaged in God's mission. My favorite moment of Jesus' life might be that Luke 4 moment when he goes back to the synagogue. I like what Luke records happening there. Check it out. It says, Jesus went to Nazareth, and he had been where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. That was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. All the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. In that moment, Jesus declared his identity as well as his mission. Jesus knew who he was and what God wanted him to do. He knew he was sent here on a mission. Everywhere that Jesus went, every time he interacted with anyone, he remembered why he came. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. This meant he helped those who were hurting. He healed those who were broken. He released those who felt captive. He declared the favor of the Lord that the Lord had come. We were created for the same purpose and the same mission. And we should live and love like Jesus in the same way. It's just hard. My most recent failure at this came on the trip that Christy and I just got back from. We scheduled a couple of days in Rome, and on one of those days, we took a little road trip, a bus tour. And because the line was long when we got to the bus, we ended up on the very last two seats on the bus. It was actually a row of five. Two seats, two seats, and a very small, tiny middle seat that we hoped no one would sit in. And then that moment came. Here came our new friend from Scotland as he walked down the middle of the bus, beelining it right to that very small seat in between Christy and I and a nice Asian couple. I kept praying to myself, dear Lord, let him sit somewhere else. Dear Lord, let him sit somewhere else. And I just found myself annoyed. Part of it was I had to sit mostly on Christy's seat because he took up most of his seat, mine and his friend to the left. So throughout the six hours we were on the bus together, and most of those hours he spent sleeping, his dead weight would just kind of fall over onto my shoulder. And I had to kind of do an arm bar to like keep him from landing in my lap. I really wasn't interested in getting to know him, hear his stories about Skyland or anything else about him. I was just like so annoyed and frustrated. I, there was a period of time I was actually even reading my Bible because we had an early morning, and I thought I, it just never connected to me like, here's an opportunity to love like Jesus. And 
I just remember the horrifying shame I felt as I walked in, watched him exit the bus when we got back. He didn't say, nice to meet you. See you around. Enjoy your trip. Thanks for sharing your seat with me. Because I think he perceived my just annoyance with him. Man, that's not living and loving like Jesus. I wish it didn't apply when you're on vacation. You got just a break from like, oh, that living and love like Jesus, that's good from nine to noon on Sunday, but the rest of the week, I can do whatever I please, right? It's just not how Jesus lived. It's not how he loved. And if we say that Jesus is our Savior and Lord, then we have a responsibility to nurture this relationship with God, but also to love others, everyone, even the annoying person sitting on your seat on the bus. In the same way that Jesus loved us. Man. This mission of Jesus is really important. Everywhere he went, he lived it out consistently. And we were created for the same mission. We have to live and love like Jesus in the same way he did. So it begs the question, what keeps us from doing that? It might be how we view the world. Maybe you view the world as your oyster. It's your playground. You can do whatever you want. Maybe you feel like the world was created for you to meet your needs, to meet your wants, your desires, maybe even to revolve around your mood. Or do you see the world maybe in a way that is through cynicism? Maybe you doubt everything that's good. You focus only on the bad. Maybe you feel helpless and hopeless. I just want to point out, neither of those are the way that Jesus viewed the world. Jesus viewed the world through a, a lens of sentness. He knew what his mission was. He knew what his identity was. He knew what his purpose was. I love a prophecy about Jesus that came to life. And you see it in the way that he interacted with all people. The prophecy was this. A tender reed he will not break. Jesus showed such incredible compassion to those who were needing healing, those who were outcast, even those who were sinful. We see his focused mind and his loving heart as he enters Jerusalem on the week before he died, and he weeps over a city, showing his deep compassion. I also love that Jesus wasn't a pushover. He challenged the religious leaders who were filled with pride, who were constantly misrepresenting God and Scripture, who were taking advantage of others. You know, maybe the better way for us to see the sentence of Jesus in the, a new light today is to ask ourselves this question. Do the things that break God's heart break your heart? While we were gone, I noticed two stories that caught my attention happening right here in Evansville. The man who died freezing in the cold. And then just two days ago, a, a lady in Henderson dying again, freezing in the cold. I'm so grateful for partners like the Evansville Rescue Mission and other nonprofits in our community who are doing something to address those type of needs. I'm not asking what are they doing. I'm asking what are you doing? What am I doing? Does it break our heart that somebody in our community dies because they don't have a warm place to be? Does it break our heart that there are kids without families who are in an overwhelmed and maybe even broken foster care system, does it break your heart that there are kids of all ages right here in our congregation who don't have someone to pour into them, love on them, disciple them, show them what Jesus looks like, even within our week-to-week -week ministries? Does it bother you that there are people in our community, yes, even in Newburgh, who go to sleep at night having not eaten an entire day, maybe two or three? Does it bother you that there are people in our world who've never heard the name of Jesus or who he is in their own language? Those are things, my friend, that are missional. Those are things that break the heart of God and those are things that should break our hearts. You see, we're not here on earth just to take in oxygen or take up space. The world does not revolve around you or exist to make you happy. You exist to declare the glory of God, to tell everyone everywhere who God is and all he's done for us, especially what he's done through Jesus' death and resurrection, so that they would come to know Jesus as Messiah, Savior, and Lord, and know how to live in love like him. That's why we are here. So who are we? Well, we are people to, who help fulfill God's mission 
to make disciples of every person by helping them live in love like Jesus. And we all have something to contribute. We've all been created, we've been called, we've been gifted, we've co been commissioned for this mission. We've been sent deliberately and specifically for this mission. I want you to know we're here to help you understand what sentness is all about. So I would point your attention to the Be Sent section of the roadmap that outlines for you how you can grow in being sent. First you have to understand what we're talking about when we talk about living on mission, being sent. You have to understand we all have gifts and abilities to identify those and connect them with the needs in our community. We all must pursue justice and live compassionately like Jesus. We also must fully engage the world, even when on vacation. You know, last year, we really focused on this idea of abiding. It's where we see all three of these expressions of Jesus, how he lived and loved, come to a point where we can grasp them. And Jesus wanted us to do that so much, he used a very powerful metaphor. And this powerful metaphor was about the vine and the branches. Look at some of his words from John 15. Jesus says this, I am the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Jesus said this, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I've appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, and it's fruit that will last. All three expressions of the way Jesus lived and loved are in that challenge to us, to remain connected to God in a deep, organic, life-giving way. We remain in him and him in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. And it prompts us to love the way that Jesus does. To love in deliberate, tangible ways. The same way that Jesus loved us. And it sends us forth out of this room, out of this holy huddle to get us into the world where people desperately need to feel and know the love of Jesus. That's why we live in love like him so that we declare the glory of God in very tangible ways so that people would come to understand who he is and experience him in their life. I understand that this live in love like Jesus can feel really difficult to get our arms, even our minds around. And so these are not just mere words that we've kind of grasped and put into a little pretty picture on the website. They're actually a map for us to follow. That's why we described it as a road map, because we're all on a journey together toward Christ likeness. And all of us have a ways to go. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit working in our life. You see, being like Jesus, living and loving like him was never something that we were supposed to do. It's actually supposed to be something that we are. The Holy Spirit producing this Christ likeness in us. And that's what should be most important to us. Not because it's just the vision of our church, because that's who we are to be. And I'll just say personally, for me, I don't really care if people know Phil Heller or my name. I don't really care if people know that I'm a pastor. I really don't care if people know that I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Christian Church. What I want my wife and my kids and my son-in-law, what I want my neighbor, what I want my, the person that checks out the groceries at the store, what I want anybody who would just randomly meet me on the, the path of life to know that I love Jesus, that he's my Savior and Lord. And I don't even have to say it. They could sense it in the way that I live and the way that I love. And I want that for me. I want that for my family. I want that for every person who calls Crossroads home because that's who we are. That's who we want to be. And I hope that you'll join me on this journey. I love one of the songs that we've been singing all throughout this past year. It's called Resurrender. It just has a phrase that maybe puts into words what we can say collectively today, that this is our desire to live and to love like Jesus. So if you're interested in that, I just would ask you to stand with me and let's sing these words together just as a commitment to say, I want to live and love like Jesus. Here's the words and it goes like this. If you know it, sing along. We are your people. You are our God, we are your temple, make us holy like you are. 
We are your children. You've set us apart. God, for your glory, make us holy like you are. We are your people, and you are our God. We are your temple, make us holy like you are. We are your children, you've set us apart, God for your glory, make us holy like you are. God, I pray that you'll hear those words from the lips as we sing them, straight from our hearts, that we realize that we've not arrived, but because you've created us and you are our Father, we want to be your children. We want to live in response to the love that you've lavished out upon us through the gift of your son, Jesus, our Savior and Lord. You sent him here to redeem us, to make us fully who we were incapable of being on our own. And that was to be as much like him through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we want our relationship with you, God, to be deep and intimate and life-giving and fruit-bearing. And God, you have offered us open access to your throne room. So I pray that we would take advantage of that. We would pursue you. We would study your word and speak to you often and engage in meaningful ways with you so that we can remain connected to you. And God, I pray that that would bear fruit, not only in our lives, but in the way that we interact with others. First in this room and collectively in God's people, but also with every person that you would place in our path that we wouldn't see them as an interruption or an annoyance, but we would see them as somebody that you value and love, that we would engage deeply in relationships that are fostering accountability and support and challenging each other's life. God, I pray that we would for never forget that we have a holy mission. That mission is to declare the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been showered with love so that we could shower everyone with the same kind of love. And that, God, would produce in them a desire to want to know you more. That's why we live in love like Jesus. And so, God, we're asking for your help. We're asking through, for your power. We're asking for your strength. We're asking for your grace and for your forgiveness. We do that in the name of Jesus. Amen.